Hope you all had a great week. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. And I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. And it gets sweeter and sweeter as days go by. And no other love between my Savior and I keep falling in love with him. Over and over and over and over again And he keeps blessing me over and over and over and over and over again And he keeps blessing me over and over and over and over and over again And it gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by and no other love between my Savior and I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. And he keeps cleansing me over and over and over and over and over again. And he keeps cleansing me over and over and over and over and over again. Sweeter and sweeter as the days go by, and no other love between my Savior and I keep falling in love with Him over and over and over and over again, and I keep falling in love with Him over and over and over and over again, and I keep falling in love with Him over. Falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. Now we're at the point of to do call of worship. And uh, we'll be reading from uh, Psalms 100, verses 1 through 5. Call of worship. If you have it, please stand and repeat after me. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that may have made us. It is he that has made us. And not we ourselves. And not we ourselves. We are his people. We are his people. And the sheep of his pasture. And the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. And into his courts with praise. And into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. Be thankful unto him. And bless his name. And bless his name. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. And his truth endureth to all generations. Let us go to prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for allowing us this opportunity to rise out of our beds and to come and worship you in spirit and in truth. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all the blessings that you have given us from this point in time, Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, we just ask you as we enter into this worship service that there is, if anything is hindering us from worshiping you, O oh God, we just pray that we will lay those things to the side so we can give you the worship that you truly deserve. So Heavenly Father, as we go into the furtherance of this service, Heavenly Father, I ask you to please be with the men of this congregation that we may do these uh, do these duties and make sure that we're doing them pleasing and acceptable in your sight of God. Heavenly Father, I just ask you to be with all of the sick of this land and country, especially in the household of faith. And Heavenly Father, we just continue to pray that we study and learn more about your word and your will, and we become more like you and less like the world. So we ask this, these blessings and all the other blessings in your son's name, in Jesus' holy name. Let us say amen. Amen. Let us he's my king. All day long of Jesus I am singing. He's my song of joy will ever be. And all the while he keeps my heart bells ringing. For his love is everything to me. And I'm singing, he's my king. 
Lord, we can thank you for the cup that represents your broken body, Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for, for the bread. Uh, we thank you for the cup that, the bread that represents your broken body, Heavenly Father. We thank you for the cup that represents, represents the blood you shed for us, Heavenly Father. May we take our time, Heavenly Father, to meditate and think about the sacrifice you made for us, Heavenly Father. For through those sacrifices, we have a right to a true life. We have that life, and we have that life more abundantly. We're truly, truly grateful for this blessing, dear Lord. Thank you. Amen. for the saints, as I give an order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God had prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Let's pray. A dear grace, Heavenly Father, Lord, Heavenly Father, come thank for this opportunity, dear Lord. Heavenly Father, thank for the opportunity to give a little bit back, Heavenly Father, because you give us so much. May this collection be used for the further of your spiritual kingdom, Heavenly Father, here on earth and in this community, Heavenly Father. We are truly grateful for this blessing and this opportunity again. Amen. Amen. And uh, if anybody has any collection, whatever, the brothers will come by and they will pick it up, just hold it up, and they will, they will get it from you. I'm going to trade my earthly home for a better one bride in bed. Christ left to prepare a mansion for the children in the air. And I'll join him in that land where tis no sorrows can be found. When I receive a mansion.
morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Yesterday evening, I was given the opportunity to pick whatever scripture I wanted to. And then folks started laughing, and I think the minister decided that uh, he didn't want me to do that. But I'm going to give you the book of faith, Jesse chapter 1, verse 1. <laughs> try Jesus. Amen. 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 Don't Amen. try me. Now, the scripture for today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. That's the book of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. If you have, if you have the ability to, please stand uh, for the reading of God's word. And it reads, when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, this is, a, this is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, they don't need to go, to, need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we, we have here only five loaves and two fish. He said, bring them to me. Then he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and, and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitude. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now these who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Really makes a happy meal look good, don't it? May we, uh, let us pray. Pray with me and for me. Heavenly Father, we bow our heads to you this morning, humbly thanking you for last night's lying down and this morning's uprising. Yes. Father, we thank you for opening our eyes, strengthening, putting strength in our bones, yes. and giving us a right mind, a right and sound mind. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son who took our place on the cross. Thank you for continuously keeping us washed in his blood. Yes. Father, we ask you to comfort this congregation this day, especially the good low and the finger families. Amen. May we comfort, cry, and celebrate with each other yes. and take care of each other to the best of our ability. Yes. yes. Bless your manservant to fan the fires in our souls, yes. to feed yes. your flock. Yes. Bless our senior members. And bless our children. Yes. Yes. Father, we ask you to bless this service that we may leave here on fire for you. Yes. Amen. These things we ask in your son's name. Amen. 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 All night, all night, and all day, you know the angels are watching over me, my Lord. I'm singing.
those who may be viewing in, we want to wish you a hearty welcome to the Lion Street Church family, where we try to honor God in all that we do. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel according to Matthew. And today we're going to be looking at a passage that is not an unfamiliar passage at all. We're very much familiar with this passage. As a matter of fact, from this pulpit, we have talked about um, particulars concerning this passage. Uh, and, but today, as we look at this passage, we're going to be, again, embracing the theme. The theme, which is Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Everything that we're talking about today has to have its origin uh, in Christ. We're going to be talking about Jesus and those he touched. Everyone in here has been touched by the Lord. Amen. You know, now this doesn't matter whether you're redeemed or not, whether you're a member of the church or not, as you are just a citizen of the planet, yeah. we receive blessings. Yes, we do. We receive, you know, the Bible says, you know, the sun shines on the righteous and the unrighteous, the yeah. rain falls on the just and the unjust. But there are blessings just by virtue of you being here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That being the case, as we survey the world in which we live today, you know, we have more and more technology. We have more and more uh, strife associated with that technology. Mm -hmm. It seems like the, the technology was supposed to, to make life easy, mm -hmm. but it has seemed to have more complicated life right. the more we go through it. Mm -hmm. And so today, I want to talk about the understanding of hunger. Now, hunger takes uh, shape in different forms. It manifests itself in different ways. When we talk about hunger, we immediately think about, you know, physical food. That's right. And nothing wrong with that. That's real. Mm -hmm. But there are other kinds of hunger. You know, in the Beatitudes, uh, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So therefore, there, there seems to be a, a, a shortage of uh, righteousness. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a, a shortage of some of the basic uh, necessities of life. And then when you look at the social uh, landscape of today, we would all have to concur with the fact that there is a drought in terms of you know, common courtesy, common decency. You know, we can't, you know, when I used to walk down the street, Back in the day, we all say, what's up, what's going on, how you doing? I moved to L.A., and I walked down the street, and I walked past someone, I said, how you doing? So they almost stumbled and failed. Mm -hmm. That was so far removed yes. from that culture. Yes. When I come home now, people don't speak half the time. But there was a time when there was more cordiality. Mm -hmm. There was that kind of uh, just common courtesy and decency. Well, another thing that seems to be lacking now, and we are in dire, you know, Dan Mark said, you know, what the world needs now is love, free love, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me take that to another level. Sometimes you got to go to the next level. You know, what the world needs now is a basic compassion mm. for one another. Yeah. And so uh, I, I've come to understand more and more that compassion uh, sometimes is not natural for us. Sometimes we have to be taught how to be loving. Okay. We have to be taught how to be compassionate for our fellow brothers and sisters, our fellow man. Okay. And so therefore, I want to talk about understanding hunger from the lens and the magic point of one who needs to have more compassion for others. As we go through life, isn't it good to know? Isn't it good to know that there is always someone there who cares for you? Isn't it good to know that as you go through life, there's someone who is available to meet your every need? Right. I'm not talking about your mother, father, sister, or brother. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about Jesus. Because right. Jesus is able to meet your needs, whatever right. that need is. Right. There's nothing too big that he can't accomplish. Right. There's nothing too small that we can't bring to him. Right. Whatever your concern is today, you may be heavy laden and burdened for whatever reason. Take it to the Lord. Amen. The Bible says that we ought to cast our cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for us. Amen. And when you understand uh, that he cares for us, uh, that he is compassionate towards us, 
It helps us not only to, to feel uh, much better about ourselves, it, it helps us not only to be uh, more comforted, but it also gives us the capacity to have compassion on others. And so therefore, as we talk about Jesus and those he touched, we're looking at it from the vantage point of uh, this country itself. If you notice in this country, hunger um, is very prevalent. And I was looking at you know something the other day talking about childhood hunger. Children are going without basic necessities. And this was really revealed when the pandemic began to first hit, and therefore kids weren't able to go to school. And you know a lot of kids look forward to going to school because of the lunch program, because of the breakfast program. And now there are sometimes kids who, who go to do lunch and they go walk around by themselves. So no one would know that they're hungry. There, there, there are different after school program that if they were not there, kids wouldn't have any kind of uh, remnant of a meal. Mm -hmm. uh, they were said talking about, you know, some kids will go over to other people's house and hoping to be asked to stay over for dinner. Mm -hmm. Can we have a sleepover so I can be guaranteed to get something to eat? I'm just simply saying, with this childhood hunger, you know, running out of control, someone has to have a caring heart, uh, a heart of compassion. The question is, are we willing, are we willing to touch others with the compassionate touch of Jesus? See, we are the church, and God is calling on us uh, to show the same kind of compassion that God had for us. As God sees us, you know, around here groping in darkness, he sent forth his son. Uh, because of his compassion and love for us. Now the question is, how deep is your compassion for others? Don't answer that question. It'll show up in how you live. Don't have to answer, don't, don't, don't verbalize it. Uh, it will be realized based on how you move around, how you are quick to respond to the needs of others. When you engage in, when you engage in ministry uh, for the purpose of coming together as a collective in order to meet needs, to touch folk. That's what this is all about. And so today, as we go through this passage, uh, again, one that's very familiar, I simply want to show uh, the compassion of Jesus and how it resulted in ministry actions toward others. See, when you have compassion, uh, it's more than simply, oh, I feel sorry for you. Oh, poor child, I feel bad for you. No, no, no. One who has compassion is going to manifest itself in your demonstration. So Jesus, if he was a compassionate person, you were able to see it in the lives of those he touched. Right. We've already talked about how Jesus touched the leper. Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, he could have healed him with just a voice, with just a thought. But he knew that the man needed a touch. Because this man had been alienated <coughs> from society. He had been annexed from you know, mainstream. He could not worship. He could not have fellowship. He, had not, he was all by himself. Perhaps even abandoned by family and friends. He needed to be cleansed. Oh, but he needed the compassion to touch. Some of you in this room right now, you need a touch right now. And, and therefore, if you are uh, an object of God's uh, <coughs> healing touch, then there are others in here who have to serve as agents of God's healing touch. It's all about compassion. That sets us apart uh, from the world because we have compassion. Is that right? I don't know. And somebody, we have to be compassionate people. And so, therefore, it's my prayer, my objective, that our hearts become more enlarged to the point that we automatically see and feel the hurts of suffering of humanity. <coughs> see, sometimes we honestly, I'm not the word honestly, we honestly, you know, don't respond to needs that we don't see. We have gotten so consumed in going through our daily activities, you know, focused on my situation and my problems and my woes and my hardship that I can't see of the suffering of others. I'm oblivious uh, to the hurt 
pain and sorrow all around me. Sometimes we have developed these cocoons and we uh, are isolating ourselves, trying to insulate ourselves, inoculate ourselves <laughs> uh, against even the notice of physical needs, let alone spiritual needs. There is a such thing as spiritual needs and physical needs, and we must respond in a manner that reflects that you and I have the compassion of Jesus. That's what this is all about. After all is said and done, do you possess the heart of the Messiah? Well, let, let's, let's get into this thing. Let's get into it. I, I want to say that uh, we have to have the compassion to meet felt needs. This is important. The compassion to meet felt needs will then position us uh, to meet real needs. The brother Mary was what do you mean by that? Well, there are different kinds of needs. Now, your physical needs are real. Don't get me wrong. With that. But there is a greater need. Uh, and that greater need is for your spiritual well-being. You can go to hell on a full stomach. But you see, Jesus, off time, he recognized the physical situation. But he was much, very much aware of the spiritual poverty as well. That's why he would say, blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, blessed are those who have come to the realization of their spiritual impoverishment, uh, who realize that they are empty and they are inadequate and they are spiritually bankrupt. And sometimes you don't realize that. Yeah. But once you come to that realization, then you are blessed because then you are not open to avail yourself to the loving grace of God. And so therefore, we have to have the compassion to meet the felt needs, uh, food, clothing, and shelter, ministry. See, ministries are, are not an end in and of themselves. See, a ministry is designed uh, to help you to make inroads to those spiritual or uh, real needs. Everyone needs Jesus. Everyone needs to hear the gospel. But if my stomach is brown and real loud, I can't hear the good news of Jesus. Uh, when, 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 when life uh, demands that I seek salvation, I'm so preoccupied with all the other noise of life. Bills need to be paid. Johnny needs a new pair of shoes. Whatever the situation is, and it begins to uh, consume you and turn you, and you don't have uh, the uh, uh, spiritual capacity to open up to receive the engrafted word, even though we know that it's able to save you. So, <clears throat> meeting felt needs position us, positions us to meet the real needs of life. And so, let's look at this thing again. Uh, Matthew, the fourteenth chapter. And what we're going to do today, as we look at these passages, uh, we want to, first of all, understand that Jesus uh, had received some very troubling news. Mm -hmm. He's received some very troubling news, and there are certain things that are going on in this narrative that we have to kind of be aware of. He heard the news that John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, the one who was charged to, to make uh, the way for the Messiah straight. He had been killed. He had been beheaded. And knew that came to Jesus. And uh, at the same time, uh, disciples were returning. He had sent them out on a commission. He had sent them out on this commission. We call it the limited commission, right? don't we? Yeah. And he, he sent them out and said, don't take any purse or any, anything. Just go out and preach the good news. And he gave them power, not only to proclaim the good news, but he gave them power, you know, to heal. 
and they were coming back and they began to report to, to Jesus all that they had done, all that they had taught. At the same time, a disciple from John were coming to Jesus informing uh, Jesus that John had been killed. At the same time, uh, when Herod uh, uh, heard about Jesus, he said, wait a minute, I just killed John the Baptist. He began to hear about Jesus, and he was desired, he wanted to meet Jesus. And the Bible said that Jesus, uh, based on all of these moving parts, he took his disciples and, and, and got away. Mm -hmm. Withdrew himself. And then, because of his charisma, and because of the fame that was spreading all over about Jesus, this man who was doing all these miraculous things, the crowds came from cities. They came from all over the place to, to just be in the presence of Jesus. Maybe he may give them a teaching. Maybe he may, you know, respond to some needs they had. Whatever their thought process was, they all begin to come to Jesus. Isn't it interesting to note that when you engage in compassionate ministry, when you begin to touch people uh, with a compassionate touch, others will begin to take note of that. And they will begin to seek you out. They will seek out the church. When the church is engaged in uh, the actual real nitty gritty of, of ministry, they will seek him out. And so therefore, uh, as the day went on, and they had come to Jesus, the Bible said that Jesus began to heal those who needed healing. And then we get late in the day. And then the drama starts. The disciples begin to tell Jesus, you know, it's getting late. Time to send them all away. And we're going to deal with that as the text takes up there. I want to talk about, again, understanding hunger. And in this text, we're going to see that Jesus recognized the needs of others. That's the first thing. If you are a Christian, you remember the body of Christ. And we are striving to be like Jesus. Notice his character. He recognized the needs of others. I want to go up a couple of verses. Let's start at verse number 13, uh, where the Bible began by simply saying, when Jesus heard it, when he heard about John the Baptist, right, mm -hmm. uh, the Bible says, uh, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved. He was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed the sick. You see, this is what set Christ and his church apart from us. There are many people claiming to be the Messiah. There are many who will claim to be, you know, Christians. There are many people who will claim to be this, that, or the other. But what sets uh, Jesus apart from them? And what is supposed to set the church apart from other organizations? Well, the Bible says he was moved with compassion. The heart to recognize, coupled with the adequacy, uh, to respond to the needs of others set him apart. It's one thing to recognize someone's need, but do you have the capacity to meet that need? It's one thing to have the capacity, but do you have the heart to meet that need? And so those things have to come together. Uh, if the church is going to be uh, the city on the hill, those things have to converge, come together, and then manifest itself in compassionate ministry towards others which positions us to have a passion, passionate message of health and healing to others. Notice Jesus saw the need to retreat. Now, this kind of runs counter to the culture because it seemed like as his popularity was growing, he would have wanted to stay out on, on, on the main stage. But he was able to see something that most can't see. Notice uh, Jesus saw the need to retreat. Perhaps to avoid incident. So notice, they just brought word that Herod uh, had killed John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we hear that 
Herod is desiring to meet up with Jesus. Wow. Now, <laughs> end of the attack on the tree. That's right. But don't get it twisted. To avoid incident does not mean fear. That's true. See, Jesus understood he had a lot of work to do. His hour had not yet come. There would be an hour when he was willing to give his life to be killed. This was not the time. All things have to be done in the proper time. And so in this particular situation, he withdraws. Uh, he had an important work to complete. And jump to conclusions here. Notice, he never threw himself into danger. Remember in what was it, Matthew, the fourth chapter, when Jesus was in the wilderness? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Satan said, if you are, since you are, you know, since you are the Son of God, if you think you say you're the Son of God, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, turn these stones to breathe and all that, you know, we'll engage in this exhibitionism. He said, if you uh, are the Son of God, throw us, jump off this building over here. Mm -hmm. Just go up to the, the temple and throw the highest picture point, just, just jump off. For it is written, you know, he would give the, the angels charge over there, and they would not suffer your feet to be dashed against the stone, right? Mm -hmm. and you, can't, you can't go out like that. But you see, Jesus did not just put himself in danger's way just for the sake of others to see his power. Mm -hmm. He understood this was a time for retreat. His, his disciples have just come off his commission. And they began to talk to him about all that they had done, all that they had taught, and, and the results of all of that. And he says, come on, it's, it's time for us to have a, some R&R. Not R&R, &R, but R&I. Mm -hmm. Some rest and further instruction. <laughs> his hour had not yet come. And he goes to give this R&I, rest and instruction for his disciples after their work. Uh, on this, you know what? Do you, you not know that the feeding of the multitude is the only miracle that is recorded in each and every gospel? Hmm. All four gospels have an account of this. Different vantage points, but they all converge on the same thing. Jesus had compassion on the lost. Hmm. When he saw those who were uh, scattered, he had compassion on them. Notice, uh, the Bible says, he saw their need to be healed. In verse 13 and 14. And he began to heal all who were sick. But he also saw something else. Uh, he, he saw a, a need to feed them. In more ways than one. See, spiritual food versus physical food is always something that we have to grapple with. Yes, people need physical food. Yes, these people, uh, because of their trying to get with Jesus and be with Jesus and be under the, the shadow of his, his, his countenance, uh, uh, they, they spend time, an inordinate amount of time there, and now it's time to eat. For they're getting hungry. And now, because of people getting hungry, they can get rest. Have you ever heard of seeing a baby get hungry? If it's an empty day, wake you up at 4 o'clock in the morning. You know. And they develop a habit of, you know, getting up. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Uh, getting up. And, and guess what? They don't care about what you're doing. You can be in that ram sleep. Uh, you can be watching your favorite movie. You can be having some downtime. And then they don't care. They have a need. They say, meet my needs. Right? So when we get older, we don't yell out and scream out, meet my needs like that. We just complain and grumble and have an attitude and talk about you because you ain't meeting me. <laughs> See, we have a tour now, so we don't cry. <laughs> but, but notice this. Notice, he saw the need that triggered a response. That's the point. He saw a need that understanding of the need always triggered a response from him. And therefore, when we see need, it must trigger a response. When you see someone who is your brothers and sisters who may be going astray, shouldn't it trigger a response? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
James will say very, very clear, you know, you, you know, your brother's overtaken in the fall. Yeah, yeah. And, and then you, uh, you recognize that and you have a, a compassion and you go and begin to meet them and re-instruct uh, them in the era of their way. Do you not know that you do, when you do that, you uh, save a soul from death and you cover a multitude of sin? But it starts with a compassionate heart. When you see someone in need, you see someone in trouble, you ought to be able to respond to that need in the same spirit as Jesus would. And so therefore, notice uh, Jesus saw the need and he began to feed. He had been giving them spiritual food in his teaching, in his ministry. Uh, but now there's a need for some physical food as well. You see, a shepherd, see, Jesus is a good shepherd. A shepherd is one who takes care of the flock. Right. Understand that. There are pastoral uh, uh, identifying markers that will identify us uh, in our pastoral capacity. You know, he takes care of the flock. It was his duty to feed the flock. But to defend the flock, to take care of the young and the feeble, to lead it by green pastures, still waters. So when Jesus says of uh, the people, uh, he sees the people, guess what? Uh, one, one place the Bible says that uh, he saw them, uh, they were like sheep scattered. Matthew 9. They were like sheep scattered. Like sheep without a shepherd. And he had compassion on them. You see, uh, when Christ says uh, the people were a sheep without a shepherd, he simply means they had no teachers. Uh, they had uh, no, 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 no guides. No one who could care for them and who would take pains to instruct them. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees, they demonstrated that they were haughty and they were proud. They cared little for the common folk. And even and when they did attempt to teach them, they would simply be leading them further and further astray. They therefore came in great multitudes to Jesus. See, if you had the scribes there, you had the Pharisees there, and you had all these things in place, why in the world would they be flocking to Jesus? He had the compassion. Yes, he worked miracles, but if he didn't have compassion, what difference would that make? There have been a lot of people who had the resources to do a lot of great things. But do you have the compassion to do that? Hmm. Instead of selfishness, he had selflessness. Hmm. And therefore, they flocked to him in droves to hear him preach the gospel to the poor, to touch them, to be the good shepherd. Because we are definitely sheep. But not only that, Jesus uh, teaches us to do what he did. He, yes, he recognized the needs, right? But you see, now he needs to teach us how to recognize the needs. He had to teach his disciples, who were very, very quick to say, oh, send them away. Well, let's let the text speak for itself. In verse number 15, it says, and when it was evening, you see that? Mm -hmm. His disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place and the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves vittles. Vittles? Food! Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but Jesus said to them, they need not depart. Give ye them to eat. <laughs> this is where the dynamics get kind of hairy. See, we're talking about uh, selfless care and generosity. It had to be taught to the disciples. Now, as we begin to look at this, uh, we see that the natural inclination was concern for self. Well, maybe not. They said, you know, send the multitude away so they can eat. Right? The disciples said, send them away. That was a positive rationale. 
It was getting later in the day, right? They needed to eat, right? Uh, had they not eaten, they would begin to become very, very faint and famished and would have kind of fell out, right? So the, the, the disciples had a good heart. They would have been out for their folk. Positive rationale for negative acts. Jesus nipped that in the bud. He said, no, so no, 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 go nowhere. So you give him something to eat. Okay? Now let's look at this a little closer. Uh, they said, send them away that they may do what? Buy. Mm -hmm. That they may eat. Mm -hmm. Really what they were saying is so they won't bother us. <laughs> because they had just come from uh, this evangelistic or uh, missionary trip. And Jesus took them away so they could get rest. Sometimes you hear the statement, there's no rest for the weary. When you engage in ministry and, and you want to get some rest and then you go somewhere else and then they're coming and they're coming and they're coming. You know, one time I was very, very tired. I you know, had taken a, a weekend off and, and I went somewhere and they saw me and said, would you preach? <sighs> I just tried to <laughs> But the point is simply this. When you are engaged in ministry, in authentic ministry, people begin to be blessed by you and they begin to recognize you as someone who has compassion. Ministry don't take a day off. The disciples say, we off. We off the clock. Send them away. We off the clock. It's break time. And Jesus began to counter that. Yes, it's, there was a rational response, but there was a negative action. Jesus said, they need not go away. Give them something to eat. And the disciples said, we don't have enough. And we're not going to get into all the clothes and all that kind of stuff tonight. Today, we've been through that. I want to give you this principle here. The bottom line is, uh, Jesus said, use what you got. Remember, he said, what do you have? And he said, well, we have, you know, we get to the board over here. Remember, Andrew and Philip, remember those he asked? Mm -hmm. He asked them about the resources that were available. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and then Andrew brought the boy over. Interesting. He brought his brother to Jesus. Sometimes, you, sometimes your role is to bring other folk to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay? It may not be your role as a preacher or the teacher or the teacher or, or whatever the case may be. Your role may be just to bring someone to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Then introduce them to Jesus. We all have roles and responsibility. Function in your capacity and God will be glorified. Mm -hmm. The church will be edified. And guess what? He's going to bless you. Okay. But sometimes we have this gift envy thing going on. If I can't do this. You know, I'm, you know these brothers, you know, Jared and Shamario and Alfred and them guys, please, I can't do what they do. No. I, every once in a while, I may open my mouth and you guys all recognize that I can't do what they do. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, the point is, you know, I'm sure they have other gifts. I'm just bringing it out to prove a point. You know, I know my name. Sometimes I kind of get over a little bit and I get back to where I'm supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And I'm, glad, I'm sure many of you guys are glad that I recognize I get back to where I'm supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But the point is simply this. Uh, notice, uh, Jesus uh, wants them to use what they've got. What do you have? Mm -hmm. we, have a, we have a little sack lunch over here that's adequate. It's adequate for this little boy over here. Then he got a couple of vanilla wafers or whatever. And a couple of little, you know, dried fish. Mama fix him a little sack lunch. Mm -hmm. And he take that sack lunch, uh, which is adequate for him, but not for thousands of people. No. That's, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And as I observe, observe, and the disciples, you know, making a good, you know, inventory of what's available. Oh no, we got to send them away for some But notice this. Uh, the key to successful ministry uh, is to bring, number one, what you have to Jesus. Even when we talk about contribution and all that kind of stuff, right? You bring, give, you give Jesus what you've got. You bring that to the Lord. And he's already said, when you bring it to me, I am going to bless it. 
And notice he says, you know, uh, we ought to give uh, not grudgingly or out of necessity and all that kind of stuff, right? But when you do give, he'll give back to you. In good measure, press down, shaking together. In other words, really compressed. And it's still running over. God is able to give you what you need. Uh, he's able to give you much more uh, than you bargained for. That's what Malachi would say, you know, test me in this. Uh, bring the whole tide to the storehouse and see when I open up the windows of heaven. He said, I double dog dare you to put your faith in me. Trust in me and I will pour you out a blessing that is so vast, uh, so comprehensive, that you won't be able to spend it all. As a matter of fact, your life, you can't outlive God's blessings. You can't beat God giving no matter how hard you try. Because the more you give, the more he gives to you. You can't be God-given. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, not only is it in good measure, for example, shaken together, but guess what? He said, your, uh, you, your lifespan will run out, mm. and you will still have blessings. Mm. Yes. And those blessings will go to your prosperity. Mm. Your children, your children's children can, can enjoy the legacy of your obedience to God. Amen. When God begins to bless you, do you not know what's going to bless others around you? Uh, so many times, because of your uh, good stewardship, other people have been edified. Other people have been blessed. Uh, but when you mess up and you begin to live a life of recklessness, you destroy your whole family. And therefore, when the whole family is destroyed, the whole family tree, those yet unborn are going to be disenfranchised and disadvantaged because of the mistakes that we make sometimes. Decisions have consequences. And when we make decisions to give our lives to God, isn't that going to be easy? That's no guarantee that everything is going to be smooth sailing. It's still going to be rough because life is hard. Life is, life is very complicated. But when you have Jesus as your anchor and your support system, even though you find yourself in the midst of a storm, you can weather the storm. You don't fall apart. Uh, we can be cast down but not broken. Uh, we can be uh, faced, fatted at the sword, but we're not easily dismayed. Why? Because we understand God's got our back. No weapon that's formed against me, Amen. He is the one who's able to deliver us. He's the one who's able to, uh, and he does it because of his compassion. And when we develop the compassion of Jesus, uh, we will then be the city on the hill. When we develop the compassion of Jesus and begin to implement that thing on a consistent basis, others will be drawn to him through us. Use what you've got. He tells them very, very clearly. Notice what the Bible goes on to say. Uh, in verse, go down to verse number 17. He says, and they said unto him, we have here, but five, notice we but five, only in other words, we've only got. You see that? Yeah. We have here but five loaves and two fish. That's all we got. Yeah. You know, that we have but five. You know, and we've been kind of holding that back for everybody leave. <laughs> Send them away. And then so we can bring out our little stash by ourselves. And he said, bring them to me. Bring them hither. This is important because sometimes we have a little, but we won't use a little because when we know when you, when you lose a little, use a little, you won't have anything left. Mm -hmm. Right? So you just hoard that. And you go in the cupboard, and roaches and rats have already gone in and got you before you need it. See, we don't sow about treasures uh, in a place where thieves can break in and steal, where, where, where rust uh, can begin to uh, tarnish, uh, where, uh, 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 what's that, moths eat. You have fine garments and, and you only got big old moth holes in them. Yeah. You got food in the cupboard, it's spoiled. You got all that stuff, you've been hoarding for yourself. Okay? No, but you, when you seek the kingdom, when you begin to lay up treasures in heaven, uh, no one can take that away from you. No one can break in and take that kind of stuff from you. Use your resources to do good. It's like you're building uh, mansions and sending timber up to heaven. Yeah, when you begin to use your temporal, unrighteous manner to do good, 
you are investing in heaven. God sees that he recognizes that and he blesses you. Now, again, the key to successful ministry, uh, uh, not only success in ministry, but success in life itself. It all fo focuses on how you are able to bring your stuff to Jesus and use what you've got. When you bring it to him, he will bless it. He will break it. He will give it back to you. Let me give you this right here. The lesson will be yours. Notice, not only do we see Jesus now teaching them how to recognize needs. Okay? Move away from this send them away attitude. Uh, understand that you may not have the resources, but you are a resource. Stay with me on this. Sometimes you are the only resource that God needs to use. Amen. There may be an abundant storehouse over here, but he doesn't have you. He wants to work through his earthen vessels. He wants to work through you. Understand that. Not only does he have them to recognize the needs of others, he met the needs with the resources that were available. Okay? See, sometimes we are we, we want to, you know, when we get this government grant over here, or when we get these resources over here, then we're gonna do this, that, and the other. Let me tell you something. When you want to do something grand, and if you can't find the favorable circumstances that will allow you to do what you want to do, it is incumbent on you not to wait around for those advantages, but to create them yourself. That means, we can use another word for that. It's called walking by faith and not by sight. Yeah, it's speaking things into existence that are not there. In other words, there were two brothers saying, you know what, I want to fly. I want to fly. And, 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 the, and the woman said, well, Wilbur, how are you going to do that? And the other said, well, Orville, I don't know yet, but I want to do it. And now people travel all over the world via flight because of the Wright brothers. But at one time, it was not there. It was only an imagination. It was only, in other words, it was only a vision. But now we fly all over the place. You know, one time the people, you know what? And they, they just sitting in, in the yard at night, looking at the stars and see the moon. And the kids say, is that a man in the moon? <laughs> is that a man in the moon? And then the dad's playing around, I don't know. One of these days we'll go up there and see, huh? And they play playing, right? That boy becomes the one who eventually becomes the first astronaut. A vision. Calling those things that be not as though that's faith. Faith. The world calls it vision, but the Christians call it what? Faith. Because faith is what? The substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. These people, all they could see was these little uh, loaves and, and fish. But Jesus saw a banquet. So he said, bring it to me. And finally notice of the manner in which needs are met is important. You may have to meet, we, we are called to meet needs, but the manner and the method by which you meet those needs are just as important as meeting the needs themselves. And we hope we have a soup kitchen, right? And folk come in uh, to the soup kitchen and, and they want to get a little, and you smack their hand, get away from that pot. There's a way, there's a manner in which we do that. And that manner indicates our heart for those we serve. See, Jesus demonstrated uh, the heart and the art of service. See, there is an art of service. We have to have some know-how, okay? And how to deal with crowd management and how to administer different things. When there is an art to this thing. But there's also a heart to this thing as well. The love is that I want to do it. I may not get it all right. Brother Mary, brother messes up a whole lot. You know, we all miss it sometimes, but people can never uh, mistake your heart 
They may deal, they may question your methods, but they shouldn't be able to question your heart. The method you can get right. But now notice the strategy here. Notice there's something called ministry strategy. Let's go back to the text, verse 19. In verse 19, uh, it says, he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. You see that? In other words, things have to be done how? Decently and in order. We don't want everybody running around trying to grab food. We don't want folk, you know, jumping in the line. And, you know, we were doing the turkey giveaway, right? We had this, this trail of turkeys in it. And we was, and, and people were, and, and the crowd would get to swell. You know, we gave them our cards. I mean, that's actual deck of cards, right? <laughs> and we began to call different numbers, and they would come and, and get their turkey. And how some, a good friend of mine would say, and keep it moving. <laughs> they got a turkey. Keep it moving, right? Can you imagine if we just sling a turkey out? There'd be people walk away with four or five turkeys. And then some people going away with none. He said, sit everybody down. And I can imagine them being set down in companies. Because the Bible said when Jesus, uh, when, when the food was distributed, Jesus didn't give out the food. You see that in your Bible? He didn't give out the food. He gave it to his disciples. And so therefore, he's empowering uh, the disciples to be engaged in the process. So therefore, when they sit people down, I can see them sitting them down in large companies. That will make it easier to manage the distribution process. They did not throwing, you know, fish. He said, he commanded them to sit down on the grass. And notice this. After the command to sit, it was orderly. But when the people sat, they knew they were sitting for something. Therefore, now there is an expectation. They didn't see any food. But now they're seeing. Then now there is an expectation. There is an excitement based on the expectation. They, they want us to sit down. Or something get ready to happen. We don't know what's going to happen, but something's getting ready to happen. So therefore, there is a, an expectation for a blessing. Because he was in the prophet, he was in the habit of blessing folk. Is he going to do some healing? Is he going to do some, what's going to happen? But they, and it, they're expecting a blessing. And, so, and then he used the available resources. Bring those loaves and bring those fishes. Bring them to me. And they brought them to Jesus. And notice what he does. Notice this is the ministry strategy now. The Bible says he took it and then he blessed it. The Bible says, looking up to heaven, he began, uh, he's acknowledging God as the source of all blessings. And this is not for his sake, it's for the people's sake. He, uh, he's helping the people see that God is the one who's able to supply all of your needs. I don't care what those needs are, God is able to give you what you need. So he begins to, to bless it. In other words, he's praying. And then, watch this, the Bible, he break it. You know what that means? See, that's the multiplication process beginning to take place. Because the more he broke, he had more to break. And he broke it. And then, notice, and then he did what? He gave it. He gave it to those who were now responsible for administering the food to others. Everything that you do has to have a strategy. You just don't go, you know, spontaneously doing any and everything. Many times when we do that, it results in nothing really being done. So he, he commanded the sick. He used the available resources. He blessed it. He break it. Or he multiplied it. And he gave it to the disciples. And they gave it to the multitude. And therefore, when you engage in a ministry strategy, <coughs> a ministry strategy, there is going to be ministry accomplishment. The Bible said, that they all ate. But not only did they all eat, they were all what? Satisfied. Mm -hmm. There is satisfaction in ministry accomplishment. Mm -hmm. When you are able to accomplish something. See, this is not a human achievement here. This is something that only God, this is a divine accomplishment. Only God could do this. Take two little old pieces of bread and a few <clears throat> couple of pieces of fish and, and then multiply that and feed 5,000 men. We didn't even count the women or the children. But everybody ate. But not only did they all eat, they were satisfied. And there were leftovers. Everybody came with some Tupperware. <laughs> <laughs> leftovers. Plenty. 
God is able to give us all we need. And the result is that God was glorified. See, when everybody came to church and they left satisfied, and everybody went away talking about how good God is, how good Jesus is, God is glorified. So not only did Jesus have compassion for the hungry, but he opened up the eyes of his disciples so that they too could see people through the lens of the good shepherd. How do you see lost humanity? How do you see those who are disenfranchised? How do you see the hurting? The naked, the cold, the weary. You can't address the needs of others without first understanding the need. Jesus saw them hungry. He understood hunger. He, he looked hungry. In the, do you not know Jesus was 40 days and 40 nights hungry, not eating? Some of us stomach growling already. Can't wait to get out of here and go get something to eat. I get it. That's physical. Okay? He understood hunger. God knows that unredeemed humanity are lost. And they're in need of his saving grace. He understands that. That's what the Bible says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only God's son. He understands. Now the question is, as agents and disciples of Christ, do we understand? Can we see what Jesus sees? The disciples didn't see it. He had to help them to see. He had to bring them along. Sometimes we need to be brought along. Praise God for that. And I pray uh, that we are brought along to the point that we're able to see past the physical, past the felt need. And understand the real need. And the real need is everybody needs a Savior. Everybody needs Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. As I said earlier, you can go to hell on full stomach. But do you not know when you understand that Jesus is the bread of life? And Jesus is the one who's able to give us according to his riches and glory. He gives us everything that we need. Do you not know that God loves us so much that not only did Jesus, Jesus die, he was buried and rose again on the third day. You know that you need a Savior. And because of that need, it ought to bring you to render submission to Jesus. It starts by simply saying, yes, I know I've sinned. You know, I have not always got it right. Matter of fact, I've messed a whole lot of stuff up in life. But I know there's somebody who can fix it. Jesus can fix it. And I believe that he can. And I believe it so much that I'm willing to scrap everything that I'm doing. And I will now turn to follow Jesus. I want to follow him. I want to surrender to him. I want to submit my life to him. I want to repent of all the things that I've done, and I want to get a, a, start a new, a, a new life. Because I believe that Jesus is indeed Lord. And I want to surrender to his lordship by being buried in the watery grave of baptism for the remission of my sins. That puts me, that's, that's why I get the spiritual nourishment, the spiritual feeding that allows me to grow strong and then begin to bring the bread of life to others. That's our mission. That's our assignment. Think about that together. We stand and sing the song of encouragement.